And then, of course, there's anime that's all three of these all at once. Right? Maybe the Fireflies is very apocalyptic. It's about a very apocalyptic pun. It is also nostalgic in the sense that it is trying to remind you of what those times were like. It is reminding you of what life was like during World War II. Right? But it's also celebrating their lives. Takahara has said, um, this movie is about how much, how much fun they had while they were alive. How much joy they found in each other and their experiences when they were alive. He wanted to celebrate the fun times in their lives as opposed to dwelling on the other stuff that happened. Right? I don't know about you, this is the kind of thing I watch anime for. Right? This is a character who accomplishes nothing. Humility of failure. He's certainly a protagonist, but he's not saving the world. This is utterly unlike the kinds of stories we tell, and I found it absolutely entrancing and amazing. Right? So Japan provides us with these very different kinds of stories. They give us a different window into experience. In life. If you want to read more about these, these topics, A, I am at geekarchaeologist.com where I have posted these slides. So you can download these slides there. Uh, Macadamia is a series of um, academic articles, it's actually an academic journal about anime and manga. So they write actual, you know, academic works about these topics. They're, they're up to volume 10 now, I think. Robot Ghosts and Wire Dreams is a collection of articles originally written in Japanese about Japanese science fiction. So if you've ever wondered why almost every anime and manga series involves some mystery, somebody with a mysterious past, something that's not really what it seems to be, you'll find out why in that book. Paul Gravitz, Manga, 60 Years of Japanese Comics, does a great job of explaining where anime came from, and a lot of the manga tropes and um, genres that started to uh, really inform uh, anime and a lot of those um, stories. And then Susan Napier's Anime from Akira to Howl's Moving Castle is, as far as I know, the first academic book written about anime, and it suffers for that. Um, it is very much somebody trying to write about this thing for the first time based on very little anime being available in English at that point and making a lot of assumptions as a result of that. Um, she tries to tell you what Japanese sexual mores are like based on what hentai was available at the time in English. Oh, no. oh, no. In like 1995. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the mind boggles. Um, but a lot of the other material in that is, is also very helpful. Um, thank you for sitting there so quietly this whole time. Uh, this has been very helpful. Do you guys have any questions? Yes, sir, in the back. Thank you. you talk about the, um, like the Western tropes about heroes, mm -hmm. like you know, heroes being more individualistic. Yeah. Um, now, we see, we see a lot in modern fiction. Do we, mm -hmm. we also see that a lot in like ancient mythology and old stories as well. I think we do generally, like you said, it depends. It, but, but I guess it's less pronounced or something? Well, it, um, more in, in the sense that in older stories, I certainly see more central characters. You know, think Homer. You think all those stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. True. Um, it also gets complicated by the fact that say Native American stories are often less about a hero and more about um, conflict between several characters. Yeah. So it's, you know, trickster versus this. Yeah. Um, um, so it really does depend a lot, but when I, when I read you know, the Greek myths and the Roman myths and um, a lot of the, uh, the Celtic myths and things, they tend to be more about heroes, Kukulin, and people like that. Um, now in Japan, I am probably painting a slightly over the top, well, I think during the West, right? Um, while there is certainly a hero in there, it's a team of four. Yeah. And so they're, they're bouncing back and forth. So there's there's usually at least more social dynamics in okay. Russian stories than others. Yes, sir, in the back. Um, I went ahead and added all your links to the guidebook. Thank you. So uh, anyone here who uses the uh, guidebook yes. or um, on your mobile phone to keep track of uh, what's going on in the convention. Uh, if you go to his, uh, any panels hosted by him, all of his links are there, so you can go to any of his stuff. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, there's an app for the con, which is awesome. 
Um, speaking of, I'm going to be doing a Parent's Guide to Anime here at 8. Um, tomorrow at 10, I'm going to be talking about, it's called uh, Ink and Paint Come Alive. It's about how anime is actually produced in Japan in terms of animators and directors and who makes the money and all that kind of stuff. Um, at noon, I'll be doing Gundam 101, where I'll go through every Gundam anime series ever made, and I'll be in costume. Um, and at 2 p.m., um, I'll, I'll be doing one of my favorite panels called Understanding Japan Through Anime, where I go through about 20 different anime, TV series, and movies, and so forth that are reasonably accurate about actual Japanese culture and history. So you can actually learn more about uh, Japan. It's also a good one, actually, for parents and kids, because it, it's stuff that you can actually use in schoolwork. And say, oh, I, I, this is research, right? I'm watching this anime for school reasons. Um, any other questions? Yes, sir. Any particular, because I was talking about mythology mm -hmm. earlier, any particular mythos you find interesting in general? Like mm -hmm. Greek, Norse, Roman, ah. Celtic? Well, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, growing up, I was a Greek myth kid. So um, yeah, I, I just I devoured those. Um, Right now, it's definitely more Japanese myth. Um, I'm actually reading the um, technically myth, um, the novelization of Musashi, um, uh, Mimoto Musashi. There was a there's a 800 page uh, novel about his life that took as much as is known about his actual life and then invents sort of an adventure story all around that. Cool. It's become kind of the modern you know version of his life. And it's interesting comparing that to what people actually think about Musashi. It's a great example of people, somebody writing a version of his life and then that becoming the actual text what people think his life was actually like and seeing how that grows out of pop culture. Yes? Yokai and Yori. Yokai! That's the TV show. Right. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, so Yokai are fascinating because. They're freaky. They're freaky. Um, if you want to read more about yokai, there's a wonderful book, I think you can still find it, called The Night Parade of 100 Demons. Uh, it is done by a, I believe, a Japanese illustrator living in America. Uh, and he does an illustration of a yokai and then a, a, a full page description of the yokai. There's all the way through. There's actually a website out called yokai.com, which actually oh, nice. has, you can click on the name and then mm. it has a, an artist's picture and how to. Nice. What's his name? What's it? Hobbit. Ah, <laughs> What's it? Eats. Yeah. And then the description, the interaction, and the origin. Nice. The legend sometimes. Cool. Um, yeah, what, what's interesting about yokai from our perspective is that um, yokai grew out of what people, about through a lot of rural mythology. So yokai are roughly, very, very roughly Japanese fairies. Well, um, they, they're the Japanese versions of Sasquatch and the Yeti, right? They are the, the mythical creatures that are supposed to exist, but they usually have some spiritual, in the broadest sense, connection to things. Fairies is... Like the fairy in Celtic mythology. Some, some of the, yeah, exactly. The fairies in Celtic mythology. And they're not demons, right? There are no demons in Japan. You know, we have no good translation for that. Demons so more Abraham concept. Abrahamic? Demon in the modern sense. It's more Abra it's tied to Abraham. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Um, I know that it was free. It was just on Facebook just mm. a while ago, mm -hmm. but um, Miyazaki actually, I think, mm. he's the one that did Princess Mononoke. Mm -hmm. He said that uh, leprosy was actually the disease. Yeah. Um, I didn't know about, like, I guess I was too young when I watched it. Yeah. But I thought that was very uh, interesting. Absolutely. And, and Princess Mononoke is a great example of this whole thing because there, there are a lot of, um, obviously, the Kodama are yokai in a way. Um, a, a version of, 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 of that. But it is, um, Princess Mononoke is about the connection between humans and that world. Uh, and one of, one of Miyazaki's ideas was trying to reconnect us with those ideas. The idea that we, do, we shouldn't completely forget all that stuff because there's a reason people came up with it in the first place. Right, yes? It's the horse spirit, Kira? Uh, it's crossed between two. One's a Kira and the, the Nightwalker is another one. Okay, yeah. And, and the other complicated thing is that um, uh, Miyazaki obviously built up his own sort of mythology for it, so it's not 
precisely what it is. The other interesting thing is, Princess Monoke is set in an actual real Japanese period. Like, everything you see in there you know, goes back to actual stuff that they have pulled out of the ground from hundreds of years ago in Japan. So that is not just a fantasy. The idea is that would have actually happened at the time. Yeah, 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 exactly. It, it's historical, if you will. Historical fantasy. Anything else? I think I'm kind of well. I'm actually out of time. Thank you all very much. I want to make uh, time for the next person. Yeah, dinner time. <laughs>